And to our top story, independent researcher David Bruce has extensive experience in policing. He specifically studied Marikana. Eleven years on, he has a really interesting perspective, and he's written in the Daily Maverick, and I'm quoting here, the massively disproportionate violence unleashed by the police armed with R5 automatic rifles on the 16th of August was ultimately what came to define the episode. But what emerges from engagement with the full Marikana story is not merely a one-sided account of continuing state repression and brutality or the so-called toxic collusion between the state and big business, but a more complex story about violence. Well, he joins us now, David. Thank you so much for your time. Have we actually fully unpacked this complex story of violence 11 years later? Um, well, I, I think that... Um, the, the, the answer to that would be no. I think what tends to happen with marijuana is in some ways it's a divisive type of issue. People um, tend to look at it as a in a, in a kind of one-sided way. They either um, uh, have a type of antipathy or animosity um, to the state and the police and um, you know hold the police responsible for everything that happened. And indeed, you know, the, uh, most of the deaths that happened at Marikana uh, were as a result of the use of force by police. But there is a more complex story, and um, you know, and there is a, you know, and so other people sort of look at it as simply an issue where um, the violence was something that the the strikers brought upon them upon themselves. So you know, the the, the, the one starting point for you know uh, having this conversation is to try and understand what actually happened at Marikana and the way in which, um, you know, over several days, um, a, a series of incidents um, contributed to perceptions on kind of both sides of the conflict, mm. that um, there was, a, you know, that there, of, of hostility and antipathy and, and, and indeed fear on both sides. And so, you know, there, there, there was, a, you know, increasing... Um, distrust um, that ultimately, you know, was a major factor that that, that led to the, the final result. Yeah, I mean, it's an important point you make. And obviously, as you say, the police um, were responsible for most of the killings and most of the killings happened on this day. Eleven years ago, I was speaking to the NPA a little earlier. And of course, they've got information now from IPED, the police watchdog. But they haven't actually prosecuted anyone uh, fully in terms of the police on that day. Why do you think it's taking so long? Do you think that it's literally just been such a hot potato no one's wanted to deal with it? The police don't like investigating their own um, and it's just been delay and delay? Or, or would you accept when the NPA says, look, one of the big issues is we just didn't have capacity? Well, you see, I mean, I, I think there's different things. I think that certainly, um, uh, you know, there may have been, there may now be more... Um, interest in examining the case on the part of the NPA, but I think for a long time it was largely neglected as a case and, and so it didn't really receive um, attention from within the NPA. Um, but but a, a second thing is, of course, just to what degree you can put together a prosecutable case. I mean, I heard earlier you were speaking to one of the people involved in the uh, Senzo Miyio case, which you know, compared to what happened at Marikana, would um, appear to be, you know, a, a, you know, at face value, would appear to be a, a far more straightforward case. And we, you know, we're seeing how the, that case in itself is turning into a protracted saga within the criminal justice system. And so, you know, I don't um, necessarily um, see it as a, as a straightforward matter to put forward a case against, um, you know, specific individuals. Um, related to the events on the 16th at Marikana. I think uh, the major failure there in case is, in fact, um, on the side of the police themselves, because I think there are clear cases where disciplinary uh, um, measures should have been implemented against, um, you know, members of the SAPs. There are, for instance, um, members of um, the National Intervention Unit Mm. who appear to have been flagrantly dishonest in the statements that they submitted about the, 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 the events at Maricon. So, you know, I would have thought that, that something like that should 
you know, at the very least be basis for disciplinary action, but nothing of that kind has been done. But in terms of the shooting themselves, um, you know, uh, I think that it's not necessarily straightforward as to how to prosecute Mary Connor. Fair enough. Um, you were also part of a panel of experts tasked, I think, with looking at what went wrong in terms of the policing. Um, because really what emerges uh, from, from the accounts given to the Farland Commission is it was chaotic, communication was appalling, um, there was a lot of fear all round and just terrible decisions were made. Um, as you make important point, especially around scene two, there was protracted shooting on the part of the police um, and then attempts to cover that up. Um, but talk to me about reform since then within the police. Were important lessons learnt um, within the police and were they successfully impl implemented? And I'm asking that because I suppose we want to know, um, have things changed in the police? Could this sort of thing ever happen again or would it never happen again because of the interventions afterwards? Right, okay, well, you see, there are two very basic things that happened. They were actually implemented by the police um, in the period fairly directly after um, Marikana. The one thing was that, um, you know, in the period before Marikana, there had been a, a shift towards the, the use of these um, tactical units, like the National Intervention Unit and the, the tactical response teams um, in the policing of protests. They, they'd, uh, in some ways, they, the, uh, what had happened was that the pop units uh, had been, uh, the maintenance of the pop units had been neglected and, and government was encouraging the SAPS to uh, take a much harder line against protest. And so what ultimately happened at Marikana was that um, the, these units, um, armed as they are with, R5, with R5s, were deployed and in fact, um, were largely in command of what happened at Marikana. And so there's two very basic things that happened. The one thing was that the SAPS has learned and internalized the lesson that you do not use um, automatic rifles of this kind at, um, in the policing of protest. And so we haven't, you know, to, uh, with one significant exception, where a student was killed at a protest in at uh, I think, you know, uh, uh, in a university in Limpopo, uh, we haven't seen um, continued use of um, uh, automatic weapons in the policing of protest. And so, you know, there hasn't been anything of that scale. And the other thing is basically, uh, to a large degree, the principle has been institutionalized that, you know, the uh, responses to protest need to be under the command of trained pop commanders. So, um, so there have been more far-reaching recommendations that have been made relating to public order policing and other aspects of the policing system. Um, and those other types of recommendations have largely been disregarded. But at a very, very basic level, there have been some kind of fundamentals that have been, um, you know, fundamental lessons that, 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 that my understanding is that they have been internalized within the SAPS. Mm, a complex issue, as you say, uh, and context is so crucial, uh, not only around Marikana and the run-up uh, to that tragic day, but also our society and how we interact and deal with violence. Thank you so much for your views this evening. Independent researcher David Bruce.